Okay, today we're going to talk about one-to-one -one functions and their inverses. Um, in the last section, we kind of led up to this, and we've already talked about one-to-one -one functions, so I'm not going to really go into that in big detail. But you might remember that you can use the horizontal line test to determine if functions are one-to-one. -one. And so this first function is a one-to-one -one function because a horizontal line only crosses it at one once. I mean, a horizontal line uh, always just crosses it at one place, whereas this right here is a is not one-to-one -one because you, the horizontal line crosses it at two places, and this is not one-to-one -one because the horizontal line crosses it at more than one place. Um, you might think this uh, horizontal line would be one-to-one, -one, but technically, if you laid the horizontal line on the horizontal line, then you find that the horizontal line crosses that line at a lot of places, infinitely many places, actually. So anyway, so why are we concerned about functions being one-to-one? -one? Well, th the reason is, is we're going to find out that that if we want to find those inverses, we're going to have to realize that the function must be a one-to-one -one function. Now, let's just take a look at part two here, where I'm just going to show you that if you look at a linear function, most linear functions are one-to-one. -one. Because, you know, we've talked about this before, negative 2 corresponds only to negative 8 in this graph, and negative 8 for y corresponds only to negative 2 for x. 0 corresponds to negative 2 for y, and if you, pl if you plug negative 2 in for y and solve for x, you'll get 0. And same thing with 1. So, so in other words, there's a 1 to 1 pairing here with, these, uh, with this function. Um, if you if you take this function x squared minus two, you you don't have to look very far to find a point where you get the same y value from two different x values. So here we see that zero corresponds to an x value of negative two, and zero corresponds to an x value of positive two. So that tells me that this function is not one-to-one. -one. Um, sometimes it might be a little more difficult. Here I had to, you know, had to work on this one a little bit, but but I found that if I plugged, that if I uh, plug uh, 2 in for uh, x, I would actually get absolute value of negative 2, which is 2, and then 2 plus 3 is 5. So the y value 5 corresponds to the x value 2, but also if you plug 6 in for this, you'll get 5. And so, so the y value 5 corresponds to uh, the x value 6 as well as the x value 2. So this one is not 1 to 1 either. Okay, now... You could easily graph these and determine that because obviously this is a parabola that opens up, so it would look something like that. And then, of course, this is it's going to look like some sort of V. So you could easily see these graphs will not satisfy the horizontal line test, so therefore they're not going to be one-to-one. -one. Now, let's go ahead and move on to inverse functions. Um, notice I said two one-to-one -one functions, f of x and g of x, are said to be inverses of one another if f composed with g of x is x and g composed with f of x is x. And so, in other words, a function must be a one-to-one -one function to have an inverse. Now, if I were to give you two functions and say find or prove, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say fine. If I said prove or show that these two functions are inverses of one another, that actually is not too difficult. 
Let me give you an, an analogy. If we wanted to determine if two people were brothers, um, if we had the two people, we could probably figure out uh, if they were brothers by just comparing their, their blood and running tests on their DNA or something, something like that. Well, that's kind of what we have here. We suspect these two are inverses, and the only reason we suspect them is because I gave them to you and said show that they are inverses. So all I have to do is show that they satisfy this definition up here. So f composed with g of x, that just means f evaluated at g of x. So I take the f function, I replace it with the g function wherever there's an x. Well, there's only an x right here. So I'm going to put, an, I'm going to put the 1 fourth x minus 11 fourth right here. I'm going to sub it in for x. So I have 4, and then, of course, this is where I'm subbing. I'm subbing this in for x. And so I have 4 times 1 fourth x minus 11 fourths and then plus 11, don't forget the plus 11. And then when you multiply 4 times these two terms, you actually get x minus 11, and then you have the plus 11, and so the minus 11 plus 11 cancel and give you x. So that's the first half of the proof. Now, to go the other way, g evaluated f of x, I actually go to this function, and I replace x with 4x plus 11. So... Here I have 1 fourth x minus 11 fourth. So here I have 1 fourth. And then here's where I replaced x with 4x plus 11 minus 11 fourths. And then if I distribute the 1 fourth, 1 fourth times 4x is x. And 1 fourth times 11 fourths, I mean 1 fourth times 11 is 11 fourths. So I have x plus 11 fourths minus 11 fourths. And then the 11 fourths minus 11 fourths cancels and gives me x. Let me direct you to this insert right here. And this is something that's always true about a function and its inverse. They're always reflections of one another about the line y equal x. And not the y-axis or the x-axis, but the line y equal x. And let me show you the graph of these two functions. All right, this is the graph of these two functions. Here's the, the red one is the graph of uh, 4x plus 11, and the purple one is the graph of uh, 1 fourth x minus 11 fourths. Now, let me insert the graph y equal x. Notice that if you look at this line here, y equal x, you'll notice that if you look to each side of it, these two graphs are reflections of each other about this line y equal x. And that's always true of inverse functions. Okay, that was so much fun. Let's do it again. Let's say x cubed minus 3 is one function and the key root of x, key root of the quantity x plus 3 is the other function. Now let's evaluate the first function at g of x. So that means I'm going to replace x with this cube root function over here. So if I do that, then I'm going to be taking this cube root function and cubing it and then subtracting 3. Well, when you cube a cube root, as we learned earlier, you're going to get just what's in the root, or what's in the radical, x plus 3. And then you've got a minus 3 hanging around on the outside, and then 3 minus 3 cancels, and you get x. So that's the first half of the proof. And now if we go the other way, evaluate g at f of x. Well, now i got to go in here where g is, and where this x is, I have to replace it with this x cubed minus 3. So I take this cube root of x plus 3, but I replace x with x cubed minus 3. And now you can see that x cubed minus 3 plus 3, the minus 3 and plus 3 will cancel, and I'll get the cube root of x cubed. And of course, the cube root of x cubed is simply x. Okay, now... Let's look at the graphs of these two. So the, the red one here is the graph of x cubed minus 3. The purple one is the graph of cube root of x plus 3. Now let's inlay the graph of y equal x. And again, notice how you have a mirror image on this side and this side. 
of the line y equal x. And even up here, this is a mirror image of this piece. So again, a function and its inverse are always a re reflections of one another about the line y equal x. All right, let's talk about the steps to finding the inverse of a function. We're going to assume that the function that we're looking for the inverse to is 1 to 1, because if not, it has no inverse. Okay, so the first step is to write the function as y equals. The second step is to just switch the x with y and the y with x. And then the third step is to solve that new equation for y, and what you get is actually the inverse of the original function. So let's see how that works. Here's f of x equals minus one third x minus five. Okay, so step one, I'm going to write this as y. Let's throw away the f of x and let's just write it as y equals minus one third x minus five. Then let's replace y with x. Everywhere I see a y, I'm going to put an x, and everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put a y. And now let's solve this equation for y. So to do that, I'm going to have to multiply both sides by 3 to get rid of that denominator. So 3 times x is 3x, and 3 times all of this would give me, um, that would give me minus y minus 15. So I would have 3x equals minus y minus 15. And then I could easily solve this for y and get y equals 3x minus 15. And that happens to be the inverse of the original function. And this is the notation for inverse. Remember, that's not a reciprocal. All right, let's do one more real quick. Um, here's x minus 1 over 3 minus x. Write it as y equals. And then replace y with x and replace x with y. So here I replace and here I replace. Okay, now I want to solve this for y. So let's get rid of my denominator. Let's multiply everything by 3 minus y. So if I multiply x by 3 minus y, I get this. If I multiply the fraction by 3 minus y, then what's going to happen is that 3 minus y is going to cancel, right? So now if I distribute here, I get 3x minus xy. So I'm going to put that there. And then this is just going to be y minus 1 since everything canceled. And then I'm going to get the, um, all the terms with y are going to be moved to the right. So I'm going to take this minus xy and I'm going to move it to the other side. And then I'm going to take this minus 1 and I'm going to move it to the other side. And then that's going to give me this equation, 3x minus y equals y plus xy. Then I'm going to factor the y out. I'm going to factor the y out of this side. And it's, well, actually, I turned it around. But then I'm going to factor the y out of this side. And I get y times 1 plus x. And then I'm going to divide both sides by 1 plus x. And so I get y equals 3x minus 1 over 1 plus x. And after I do that, I realize once I've got the y isolated, what's on the other side has to be the inverse. So that's the inverse of this function. So in other words, these two functions, this one, this one here, and this one here, are inverses of one another. And let me show you that on the graph before I shut this down. Actually, it's a good thing I went to do that because I just caught a a sign error I had made here. This should be 3x plus 1 and then all the way through here just carry the 3x plus 1 through and then the inverse is 3x plus 1 over 1 plus x not 3x minus 1. And actually if you go back and now I'll leave that open for just a few seconds in case you want to make that correction. Um, so if you go back and look at the graphs of these two functions that are inverses of one another, again, the, the red graph or the orange looking graph, whatever you want to call it, is the uh, first function. And then this is the second function, the purple graph. And notice that when I inlay y equals x, notice how this is symmetric to this piece and this piece is symmetric to this piece. So now you have, you can see the symmetry about the y-axis. And we'll talk a little bit more about inverses 
on the uh, next video.